Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, the Wickoff Organization, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, Maringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and these friends. Senandela the artist, Senandela the capitalist, Senandela the rogue. <laughs> Last week we told you a little bit about the early days of Robert Senandela, the world-renowned painter and artist. This week we're going to continue on from about age 18 to the current day. So you're at the Art Students League. We were talking about you sold the I Love Ludwig, okay? And the I Like Ludwig did very well and it helped pay the tuition. What happens at the Art Student League? You meet this person who was a political painter also from Germany. What happens? Uh, I went to the Art Students League because that was the one school I could get into without a, a high school degree. I meet a man named George Gross and uh, it changed my life. I, I didn't know who he was, I just knew that he uh, apparently was uh, teach life drawing, and um, that's one of the things they never taught at uh, music and art because they were talking in those days about every you know everything was about um, expression and this and that. And, and I was actually looking for a little more technical abilities at music and art. But here I meet this guy, and basically one day I realized that this guy could just so talk about what he could do. What effect did he have on your painting? The, the effect is really that he, uh, that maybe instead of going into writing, which I had now had gotten a little notoriety for, you know, with my uh, atom bomb drill uh, piece, um, he proved to me that, that drawing, number one, could be taught, <laughs> and number two, the importance of drawing uh, as it relates to painting and to everything else in your... So what would you say was your first important painting? My first important painting was, was a, uh, a still life, a, a still life that I did uh, after I had stopped um, uh, studying with him. I realized that I could, that I could paint what I, what I saw and what I... And what I when do you uh, leave the Art Students League? In uh, '59, you also leave living with your uh, with Senandela right. at 301 at 310 West 79th Street to now to 301 East 50th Street. Right. 
And from there, you start some paintings of the city. Because most of, in many part of your life is paintings of New York City and New York City life. Right. New York became my, that, that was my palette. You know, that was my, uh, uh, Second Avenue was a, uh, one of the early paintings I did. Um, and at the time, that painting seemed absurd because it was like a, you know, the biggest uh, uh, pile up of cars you could, you know, uh, traffic jam ever. And it was sort of like, well, Bob, you, you seem a little, you know, it's, it's a little bit over, over the top. Today, that painting is like, they think, oh, it's a mild version of what, <laughs> of what you deal with, with. So a lot of the things I've done. Um, what about the dogs? And the, oh, oh, Southern Dogs. Well, that was uh, in 1965. I had gone to the march in Washington. Uh, I went there with Anton Refugee. We left from Woodstock, New York, where I used to go in the summer. And that painting was, um, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's a painting that's never been, it, it's rarely been shown uh, because uh, a lot of my stuff has been censored. Uh, but let's talk about that. You have the, the dogs and you have the African-American people. Well, you know... And as a satirist, if that's what you want to call me, um, you realize that art isn't just, it wasn't just making a, a painting of the, the incident of the dogs and the policemen. I inverted the uh, dog's head. I put the dog's head on the policeman and I put the policeman's head on the dog. And this, this is what made the painting uh, unfashionable in the sense that, um, you know, the New York Times wouldn't publish it because of the dog genitals in the painting, you know, that, which is a little suspect. But, you know, the point is that uh, when you, uh, when censorship comes from, uh, from, from what you say, it's, it's what you, it's when it's not. Yeah, but, but you, uh, as opposed to what you say is the way you display it. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I would like to be known as an artist. I'd, I'd like people to look at my work and say, wow, it's, it's how you painted that painting that made it the way it is. But they don't do that. They, they see the subject because there's so little subject matter, or at least in starting at that time in the 50s, that was when, you know, abstract expressionism was getting, getting its uh, play and so on. But... Uh, the the uh, it it's the subject that really when you and, and if you do it right it it gets people queasy. Now when did Yes Art come out? Yes Art was it was also in '65. Uh, so let's talk about Yes Art. In '65, you're about 26 years of age. 24. 24 years of age. Okay, you had done some work. The dogs were out. The Southern Dogs was there. Uh, Second Avenue was already done couple of others. How do you decide on Yes Art? Yes Art was really my farewell to art. I got really discouraged about the art world and unfortunately at a young age I saw, I said, well hey, if a soup can can be, uh, if, that, if that can be displayed next to a Rembrandt and, and you look at it as a, I said, you know, somewhere I took a different path. I said this, so I, I did Yes Art as a way of I said, I would get the most publicity of any show in New York. And I just followed what was going on in the art world. I just did it a little differently, and I got, and I, I was the most widely publicized show of that year. Okay, I suppose Andy Warhol had Campbell's, and you felt Heinz was better? I felt, oh, oh, Heinz is always the better soup. I mean, there's no question about that. Okay, there's but no... what about Brillo? And, uh, well, Brillo's a very interesting story because um, a guy named James Harvey uh, was an abstract painter, st struggling to be a painter, so he had a job designing, designing. He, he designed the Brillo box, and uh, Warhol simply copied it and put it into a gallery. He actually made boxes, put it in the gallery. Uh, what a little known fact is that James Harvey saw he sees his, his Brillo boxes in a, in a gallery on Madison Avenue. He walks in, he says, we're, we're, you know, no, these are, these are Andy Warhols. And 
He said, no, no, I, I designed that box. I designed that box. He was suing Warhol in uh, saying, hey, this is just, you know, it's my work. Uh, uh, and oddly enough, he died at 36. And the, but had he lived and the lawsuit had... He would have won. He would have won. And pop art probably would have died. But you, but other pop art, you did with the telephone company, right? I did, uh, well, I did a number of things. I did uh, uh, out of order stickers, for instance. Uh, right. And then I did the uh, public enemy number one. Right. And uh, you did the, the ashtray and, saying no smoking. And I did the, I did the first no smoking ashtray. And when smoking was allowed and uh, you know but let's talk about the exhibit that you did with the s and h green stamps well this this was the this was the major part of the s art uh, is that we gave out s and h green stamps and where was the, where was the exhibit displayed and this was a, this was in a uh, madison avenue gallery uh, uh, the uh, fitzgerald gallery and uh, it had never been done before and uh, and I had signed a contract with S and H Green Stamps, and um, so if I bought a piece of art, I would get S and H Green Stamps. You would get yeah, that's right. You would did get, you have the gifts in the in the, and in the, the gallery gifts, too? And, and the gifts were um, displayed. Were, were were displayed. You know, if, if you bought enough art, then of course you'd get you know you get ten thousand S and H Green. You know, fill these books so up. So people you were a, people were going to. A and P, Wallbaum's, Bohack, and they were buying groceries, and they would get S and H green stamps. Right. So Senandella, the capitalist, decided that if you buy my art, you can get green stamps. You can also get green stamps, right? And that gives you an, you know, and you then you could maybe get a a toaster, you know, and so you get a, a little bonus for buying a Senandella or a piece of Yes Art, and. Uh, you know, it was uh, it, it was a unique um, a unique e exhibition. After that, what what what's the next phase of your your life? Because you're only 24, 25. What? So I've made my point. I said, well, I got all this publicity, which is what seemed what art was about a lot more publicity, less about the art. But I hadn't really felt that I was a had developed as an artist yet. But I said, hey, you know what? Uh, if if soup cans is the is the direction, uh, then I'm going to go, and I got I got a job in an ad agency, and based really based on that show, because uh, I had never been in advertising either, but they took me up because I had all this publicity from from Yes Art, and um, I had a year there, and and, and uh, that was enough of advertising for me. And you realize that that form of capitalism wasn't for you. Yeah, it wasn't quite, wasn't quite. Uh, so you continue on, okay? And that's when you did a lot of these street scenes, of, okay? And then you did the football scenes of the Giants right. and the hockey and the basketball. So that was over the period of time. Now, during this period of time, you keep in touch with George at the Art Students League. And tell me, tell the story about George and the trip he's making back to Germany that you're on the boat with him? Well, this was, okay, this is in uh, in 59. Uh, I was supposed to, uh, we'd become quite friendly and we had saw eye to eye. He went back to Berlin, his wife was sick and he leaves in 59. I go, I'm invited to go to the boat, to the ship that he's going back. We have a few drinks. Um, maybe like 20 or 30 glasses of uh, Prosecco or something of that sort. We're in pretty good spirits and we decided that maybe I should just go to straight ahead to Berlin instead of waiting to the fall. And um, I got into... You hide in the closet? I hide in the closet in his little, his little room there. Unfortunately, his wife discovers me. And uh, I am now, the ship is, you know, out going out to sea, not, it had just, uh, wasn't out of the harbor yet. And I was led over the side, brought back to uh, port, and I had to, I had to stay in New York. 
and unfortunately, uh, he ends up dying like three weeks after he got. So when do you when do you build the uh, do the painting on George's life, the death of George? Uh, the death of George Gross I did in. Uh, uh, 1962. I mean, this was the first uh, important person to me that he understood me, I understood him. Yeah, when he died, it was like a, you know, I felt, um, I felt um, part of me had gone at the same time. It was like, a, it was a, it was you know, a major, major moment. And uh, so now, as we were talking after that, Yes, Art, okay. Then you went to the advertising agency. What happens then? Well, in the, in the agency... Um, After you left the agency. That, well, that, that was um, when I had done the, um, the hostility dartboards. This was... Uh, oh, yes. Had, uh, we have to, the hostility dartboards. Uh, yeah. Uh, you had one for Lyndon. I had, I had one for... You had one for uh, Nixon. Nixon. And these were, these were the two most popular, um, but there were many other popular ones. There was, you know, Reagan and uh, there was, I, I think I even had, uh, I think I even had Castro, uh, oddly enough. And, uh, but this, this went also was sort of like the... Um, like the buttons. The buttons, it went, it, went, it went viral, even though they didn't have that in those days. So it went viral and I had a business. I had a, a you know, regular business uh, selling, um, uh, <coughs> posters and dartboards and I mean in those days I sold these boards sold in Macy's Gimbel's etc and what we were talking about capitalism and I believed it then they were today I could not I, I could not sell these same items in, in in stores like that because there is a there is a, a kind of um, you know, a, a repression in our, our our democracy does not really, you know, it's 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 only half a democracy. It's only half freedom. You know, we have, and which is too bad. What happens later on? How do you return to the Art Students League? Because I was, I didn't have to worry about making a living from selling paintings. I was able to paint without any restrictions. You know, I I painted. For myself, I painted what I—I I didn't paint for the market. So, I had a, quite a, you know, a, a lot of paintings. And uh, uh, Sachi and Sachi um, offered me a major exhibition at their on uh, uh, Hudson at, Street at, at, at their headquarters, their right. headquarters, and so on. And everything was fine until they uh, looked at a. Um, painting that I had that actually the show was built around. That was a painting of uh, crucified Santa Claus. And this was in, in the right month. It was in December, this show. Uh, and anyway, they, you know, this is the organization that that shows anything, supposedly. Right? Sachi and Sachi is known for the, for the uh, sensation show that they had at the um, um, museum in, in, in Brooklyn. And but somehow they felt this painting was not appropriate for Chris, you know, at, at that time. And they told me they would only censor the one, one painting. By the time the show was, <laughs> they, they'd take it out seven paintings, including the- uh, Papa Santa. Uh, the the um, Southern yeah. Dogs and that, and that kind of thing. And, but on that same day, this was a, terrible day for me because you know my main painting was taken out of the show I was having to compromise and you know I wanted to uh, just shut the show down but this thing had been this was a big they had promoted it for a year it was my it could have been my you know my 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 big moment you know but anyway that same day um, Rosina Florio of the Art Students League who I had known in 59 now this is 88 and she calls me and says, Bob, this is Rosita. You remember me? And I, from the Art Students League. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, how would you like to teach the old George Gross class? And I, I was silent because I had never taught. And she said, say yes. I said, I said, yes. And I met her, 
two days later, and that's how I got my, my job at the Art Students League. Let's talk about stock Dow Jones 2000. Okay, so 2001, uh, Stock Odyssey was a painting that I did, uh, which was, it had a lot to do, obviously, with capitalism, but it had to do also with, with the art market. I had, as one who, would, who always had trouble with uh, censorship of one sort or another, I felt I could sell stocks in a single painting, which had never been done before. And I uh, was lucky enough to meet a uh, financial printer named uh, Chris Cannon, and I told him about my idea. He had bought a print of the painting, and I told him that now I wanted to sell stocks in the painting, which meant that uh, anyone who, who, if you bought 10 uh, uh, shares of stock, you'd have 10 uh, prints, big, nice, beautiful prints. And if the painting sells at a later date for a million dollars, you now have, you own 10, you have 10% or, or what, what, that, what those 10 shares w would represent. And you would then, you would be. You would gain in the appreciation. Gain, yeah, you would gain the appreciation. You know, somebody might say that was like a Madoff. <laughs> they, <laughs> that, but there was, but here you had real art, okay? Yeah. As opposed to. And the idea is that you know, if you, if you buy a, if you have a, a a piece of stock, you put it in your drawer. This way, your your stock, you frame it, you have it on on your wall, so you're able to, you know, uh, enjoy the. Uh, have something to look at, and uh, it could be gaining in value. So I, I figured that was what, and that clearly is what the art market has become. It's because it's about money. It's about, um, and I thought I had really figured out the uh, uh, the way to to circumvent that, and it almost we almost pulled it off. Uh, you may be in 2017 with crowdfunding. You might be able to pull it off. With the, f with the art that we'll talk about in a little while. Let's talk about another one of your famed arts. Uh, the 150 people at um, Le Cirque. Le Cirque. Well, <clears throat> again, there's another... Um, I got, I, m one of my students at the Art Students League, uh, Murray Miller, was, was uh, married to Brian Miller. He was the writer of the food, the food critic. food critic at the and, New York Times. And he, he, she showed him my work, and he, he thought, you know, he, he had done a big review on Le Cirque, and he said, geez, this would, you know, they really, he saw all the figures that I was able to put into bar paintings, that kind of thing. And uh, he introduced me to Sirio, and Sirio said, well, you know, it's not really possible people have tried to do this, even even uh, Leroy, Leroy Neiman. Neiman had tried to do it, and he couldn't, he said, nah, it's like, you know. I said, look, he, I said, I'll do it on a dare. I said, the only thing is I have to, you know, of course I have to sit, I have to be in your I, restaurant. I have and to I, eat. Uh, and I gotta look at, I gotta do right. the drawings, and the, uh, and he agreed. He said, okay, if he, and uh, so I think it was, I think it was 50 meals later, I uh, was ready to show, to start, you know, actually working on the painting. And um, six months later, he came down to look to see where, whether he wanted it or not. He came down to my studio, I think, was, he said he had about 10 minutes. He stayed for three and a half hours. He, <laughs> they wrote a story about his, anyway, he bought, so he, so he ended up buying the painting. Um, Let's talk about the film, which has won critical awards, Art Bastard, your life story. How did that come about? Well, if, if you look at, in art history, you'll find that many times as a painter has one major buyer, one major supporter. George Gross had a guy named Eric Cohn. Um, I, man, I, I ended up having this, the guy who bought 2001, uh, Chris Cannon, And he had become more and more interested in, in the art world. Um, just, he couldn't, he, 
he said it was more it was more corrupt than than the stock world and he and he knew both worlds and he couldn't believe he couldn't understand why he said gee I, I you know your work I, you know, I kept on buying my work and he, he would look at you know he studied he got tapes and he said he was looking you know so he'd never bought a painting before you know before I bought my piece so his interest in was really not just in my work, but also the relation to why I was having a hard time getting into a gallery or that, that no museum had, had bought a painting. Okay. And he finally said, I think, I, I just, he says, it, it's interesting story, you know? And it took about five, six years to put this together, uh, went through many different phases. Uh, we we got a, it ended up finding a, um, a director named Victor uh, Konevsky and a music guy named um, Jim McDonald and special effects guy. And, and, and all of a sudden they, you know, I never thought the movie would, would, would come out. Bob was really a traditional painter. He understood the basics. George Gross said, there's no such thing as a line in nature. That's all in our head. You can bastardize everything else in your life, but if you compromise with your art, why, why be an artist? When it came out, it sort of, it re... It, uh, I, was, I was reinvented in, in a, in a, in a way. Sp speaking for it, I happen to see an excellent production. With like two minutes left, your wife Liz, right? Right. You've been married how many years? Uh, 25 years. Okay, and you have a son, David. David. David, who is a professor on taxation at the City University, Baruch. Right. Okay. Right. Quickly, with like one minute left, one of your last works is called... Fin, fin del Mundo? Yes. Uh, the End of the World? The End of the World. And, and, and this was a commission, a commission from someone who knew me 30 years ago. And he was very depressed and so on. He said, I want you, I think you could express my disheartened feeling about people like Donald Trump and Roger Ailes. And Roger Ailes and, and, uh, and Fox News and all, all that kind of thing, all the things that are. And uh, he gave me a, a, a large down payment. He said, but you have to finish it before Election Day. And I managed to do it. And uh, like everyone else, I thought that Trump would lose. And the painting was based on, it, it had a lot of the a lot of the incidents that took place leading up, except he didn't lose. And so, so now the painting is, um, I have decided to continue the painting. Right, and the painting right now is in Mexico? It's in Mexico, yeah. We're having a show in, in Oaxaca, in Mexico. And uh, uh, a lot of it has to do with the wall, the famous wall that uh, Trump wants to build. Uh, so and fin, have them pay for it, by the okay, way. Okay, so Fin de Mundo is not completed. It, it, it is it's no a work longer. in progress. It's a work in progress. But I would say that for the work in progress of this world-renowned painter-artist, capitalist also, socialist, <laughs> the kid who grew up, you know, in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and then the Upper West Side, you've done a lot, and I'm happy you've been my guest today. Thanks for being here. Well, hey, it's been great uh, talking with you. It really has.